Good morning. Good morning. Good Sunday morning to you. It is really great to be connected one more time on this beautiful, sunny South Florida sunny day, Sunday day. We are very glad to be here with you as you're joining in. We're going to just wait until um, everybody starts settling in. Good morning. Um, it is truly great to be connected this morning because we have a very special speaker with us today, as you might have noticed on our social pages. We have Alex Alves from Orlando with us this morning with a topic that is truly curious and I can't wait to listen to it. Um, good morning, Juan. But before we, we go on to present him and do our opening prayer, um, as it is customary, good morning, Vivi. We always do an opening reading from one of the books um, that are contained the messages from Chico Xavier and Emmanuel. And today we've chosen the book um, Living Spring. And the message that we have chosen is of number 13, in which uh, the topic is Let Us Set Out. And this is how it reads. I will rise and return to my father. And this is found in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 15, verse 18. When the prodigal son decided to return to his father's arm, he actually decided to rise inwardly, to leave the dark cave of idleness and head for the field of regenerative action, to get up off the cold ground of inertia and seek the heat of reconstructive activity, to leave the valley of indecision and climb the mountain of spiritually constructive toil, to escape the darkness and enter the light, to leave his negative behavior behind and plunge into the reconstruction of his ideal. He stood up and left for the paternal home. However, prodigal sons and daughters of life, such as we are, how many of us, after having failed at the most valuable opportunities, clamor for the Lord to help us in accordance with our unworthy desires so that we can be content and happy. How many of us have willingly descended into the abyss and once in it, drowning in the dark current of our passions, beg for the presence of the Almighty through his messengers so that they may attend to our whims. But if we are really committed to our self-improvement, let us stand on our own two feet and press forward. Pardon me, press forward. Any improvement requires effort. The view at the top requires climbing the mountain first. If we aspire to a higher life, let us go forward, following Jesus' standards. I will rise, said the young man in the parable. Yes, let us rise. This message is absolutely beautiful, beautiful. I do recommend once again, once we are done, I will make sure to post in the comments the chapter, the, the name of the, the chapter and uh, the book in which you can find so that we can reflect a little bit. As a matter of fact, daily readings of this message is truly going to help us out because it's interesting that Emmanuel explains the passage contained in Luke in which he tells us that when we want to progress, when we want to evolve, we need to rise inwardly. It is an internal movement. It is not something that is of external factors. And it is really interesting because everything that he mentioned in the message requires movement, requires strength, requires a, a positive affirmative action from our part with solid steps forward. And then he goes on to say to get off the cold ground of inertia and seek the heat of reconstructive activity. This is truly important because it deals directly with how we are making the most out of our time while here in this present life. So to escape the darkness and enter the light. And it's interesting that a lot of what he brings us reminded me of nature. It is important for a small seed to break through the cold ground where it is moist and where there isn't a way to breathe, seeking the light in order to grow and flourish strong. And so in the same manner, so are we. But it is up to each one of us to stand up and take solid steps towards the paternal home as 
prodigal children that we all are. On this note, I'm going to invite you to do our opening prayer with us. Um, you may keep your eyes open, closed, it's really up to you, but definitely keep your hearts, your soul open to the vibration of light, of the positive energy that is surrounding us, because it is the moment in which we feel the presence of our benefactors, the benevolent spirits, missionaries of our Master Jesus, as we ask for yet another day of learning, and we thank for yet another day of learning, the blessing of having been able to open our eyes and realize that we have one more day, one more day before the infinite of time in which we are given in order to get off of our inertia, to be able to get up from the darkness of our own souls and make the most out of the light, sunlight, moonlight, it doesn't matter. We were given one more day to be able to reflect on how we are dealing with all that we have committed with prior to reincarnating, be it our presence at home with our family members, the spiritual commitments that we made, anything that entails personal growth, all of us are aware of what that might be. And so we ask you, dear Jesus, to be with us, strengthening us. You are the sun that shines bright at all time. And even when there are clouds and it seems that the storm just won't pass, we know that behind it all, you are shining bright, waiting for us to be able to open a small space within our souls so that your light may reach deep, deep within. This morning, especially we ask for our brother Alex, who is with us, who took the time to study and bring us his reflections so that we may listen to him and see how we may proactively put into action, put into motion all that he's bringing us today. Bless our homes, our families, and even our neighbors at this time as we thank you for being with us today and always. So be it. So, Alex, Alex Alves, good morning, Alex. Thank you for good being with us. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Andrea, for the opportunity once again to be here with you guys. Thank you. Alex is not just a brother or a friend. He's actually um, also very involved in our Floridian Spiritist movement. And there we say even outside of Florida, um, he is the one of the co-founders of the Plenitude Spiritist Society. Spiritist Society, right? Not Spiritist Center. I always yes, get society. In case you're looking, I'm also going to make sure that I put in the comments in case you have somebody in Orlando that you want to suggest. This is a beautiful home uh, that Alex, along with his beautiful wife, Eliani, and other um, directors have founded and have made a very safe space for studying spiritism, for being connected through the ties of fraternity. Um, aside from that, he is also very active with the Spiritist Movement, with the United States Spiritist Federation, also doing some of the lectures, some of the lives that they have. And Alex is a dear brother, and we, we might summarize by saying that. So thank you, Alex, for being with us, and this space is all yours. Once again, thank you, Andrea. Thank you for this uh, lovely introduction. We got to be careful over here in the United States because we can't uh, we can't do too many of these uh, false advertising because you said so many good things about me and people can create an expectation that I might not be able to reach up. So, guys, be just bear with me. Don't believe in everything that Andrea just said because she's just being so nice as always. Um, but uh, once again, thank you so so very much for this opportunity. As always. Very nice to be part of the movement, especially when we can share some of our thoughts and what we have on study and present in some other places as well. Uh, today's presentation is kind of uh, tricky when you take a look on this uh, on this title, on a Jesus Church. So it looks like that we're going to be talking about the Church of Jesus inside of Spiritism, or so how Spiritism can build the Church or be a Church or something like that. It is not quite that. But are we going to be using the spiritist fundamentals 
to, to support what we're going to bring up for, for all of us guys. So I would like to do a disclaimer before we start, okay? This study has no intention whatsoever to disconstruct the importance of the religions or the institutions that we have nowadays on earth. This study has the solely purpose to broaden our view so we can take a look on this concept about the topic and uh, get some other ideas and, and teachings that can bring us another perspective. What about this church and what Jesus was expecting when he mentioned about the churches or talking about churches? Um, we'll see the, the meaning of the word the church as defined by man or, or we can find in a dictionary. And also we're going to see um, what church means to Christ based on a few passages that we can find from the New Testament. Uh, but why is this distinction so relevant to our life? Well, our idea is to present the concept that we have almost the obligation to behave everywhere as we would be inside a church. Most of us, we came from different backgrounds, religious backgrounds. Some of them we were, or some of us, we were raised it as, um, as uh, Catholics or Catholics or uh, in other Christian denominations and these kind of things. And we were thought that a Sunday mornings we should be in the church and listen to the father, to the priest, and then we should behave good inside the church. But when we left the church on Sunday morning, by Sunday afternoon, we would be fighting with our uh, family members, especially during the, the, the Sunday lunches or the Sunday dinners. There is always some kind of discussions coming up and everything. So everything that we learn and we try to practice as on Sunday morning, by Sunday night, it should be gone. What we are trying to do over here is bring in some ideas and concepts to support uh, our obligation, let's put it this way, to behave everywhere as we were on a Sunday morning mess. So that's the main topic. That's the main idea. So in order to uh, start to move on, I just don't know how to... Um, how do we move on for the next slide, Andrea? Do you control over there or do I control over here? Um, sorry about that. You control. Okay, perfect. Thank you so very much. So as we start to talking about what's the uh, the concept of the, the church and everything, let's see how the dictionary defines the word church. As we go to the Merriam-Webster dictionary, for example, Church is defined as a building for public and especially Christian worship. Also, church can be the clergy of the officialdom of a religious body. And also, we can find that church means a body or organization of religious believers. So when we look at this concept, at this idea, we are usually or mainly talk about the physical aspect, the matter. Uh, the, mor the mortar and the bricks, uh, the, the, the construction itself, uh, the building that we're talking about, or the organization that we can find on modern uh, churches or modern religions, let's put it this way. Let's not confuse the word church with a religious, because religion is one thing, uh, church is another thing. Religion means the structure that is put in place to control and to govern the actions of the church. So it's made by man, idealized by man, with the imperfections that man brings inside of, uh, of us. And, and we transfer these imperfections for our definitions, for the way that we do things, and this kind of things. So as we can find in a dictionary, church is usually referring to the material aspect or the organization aspects of a religion or, or of the church. But uh, how Jesus would define church? How, when we, when we go and take a look on the, um, on, the, uh, on, the, on the gospel, especially in the New Testament, we have some definitions and some aspects that Jesus brought to us that might bring a different perspective on that. So how church or how Christ could be defining church and where we can find those passages? Well, one of the passages that I'd like to bring to our attention is this one on Matthew chapter 18, verses 19 and 20. And where Christ says, for where two or three are gathering my name, there a man, 
there am I among them. So for there, for where, for a where, where. The verse does not specify exactly where, what place. Therefore, it can be anywhere. So anywhere that we are gathered in Christ's name, he's going to be among us. So we learn through the Spiritist books, for example, for the teachings, that thought is everything. Intention is everything. If we have good intentions and good vibes, we'd be surrounded by good spirits with the good vibes and the good energy flowing around us. But if we have bad thoughts, we would be surrounded by less evolved spirits. That's why Jesus said, gather it in my name. This is a fundamental condition in order to expand the Jesus church everywhere. But how do we get in Jesus' name? I'm going to get there in a, in a, in a, in a, in a few slides uh, moving forward. But uh, so far... I would like to you guys to capture this concept and keep that on your mind. That's why Jesus said, gather it in my name. So this is a fundamental condition so we can expand the presence and the, G, the church, the Jesus uh, church everywhere that we are. If Jesus is everywhere, it is illogical to think that the house of Christ, it's only in Catholic church, in Protestant temples or in spirit centers, or even in the mosques or the synagogues. We can forget that Jesus came for everyone. Therefore, the house of God becomes the universe. So the church of Jesus can be implemented and can be constructed everywhere that we are. As long as we have and we are united in his name with good vibes, with good intentions, so we can get to the support of the enlightened spirits as well. The second verse that I would like to bring to our attention is the one that we can find in Matthew chapter 6. I need to... Um, yes, thank you. <laughs> uh, the Ma Matthew chapter 6, verses 6 as well. But when you pray... Go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. Interesting over here, that is uh, uh, on this verse, it becomes very clear that we don't have to be at a physical church or a physical building to pray, to ask, and to connect with uh, whoever is our divinity can be God, can be Allah, can be Buddha, can be whoever we, we name as, as our divinity. We don't have to be inside a beauty in a specific place to connect with our divinity. We can do it everywhere. As long as we do it with the solely intention to connect and not to show up. Because sometimes we go to the church, to the spiritual center, or some other uh, prayer places just to show people that we're there just to show people that we are frequently or that we are present on this kind of a gatherings and everything. So if you are not being or going over there just to show up, if you are going there with the solid intention to learn and to help, then we can do this kind of things, whatever we are. Of course, the more people that we get together, the more powerful uh, uh, our waves of good vibrations will be. In our prayer, we're going to be much stronger. Our connection with the divinity is going to be also much stronger. Am I saying that uh, we should replace church and do this everywhere? No, no whatsoever. What I'm saying is that we can do it from everywhere. So as we can do it everywhere, how do we, uh, how do we gather in Jesus' name? So that's how I was going to tell you guys how we how we can get and gather in Jesus name well the very first thing is bringing his values and teachings everywhere so when we're talking about for example uh, charity as divine as, as defined by uh, by spirits book which is forgiveness indulgence and benevolence 
So we can bring and we can gather uh, in Jesus' name everywhere if we get those teachings and we apply and we use them wherever we are, in our church, in our community, in our center, in our home, in our work, and with our friends, in a party, on a crisis situation, wherever we are uh, inserted, we can bring these teachings and we can use it uh, as we were thought as well. With that, we're going to be bringing, we're going to be gathering in Jesus' name. Uh, there is a passage which I love it. I think that's really, really interesting, which is in the book, The Way, the Truth, and the Life, uh, that was channeled by uh, Francisco Xavier, by the Spirit of Emmanuel. Um, on the pre preface of this, uh, of this book, there is a passage that says this. Furthermore, the lesson of the master is not only an imperative for the purpose of worship. So the gospel is not just to read and to participate of the section of a worship, a mass or a public meeting on a spiritual center or whatever we are doing. The gospel cannot be reduced to a breviary for the kneeling board. The kneeling board, remember when we used to go to the church that we, we would that we used to kneel down to pray and do our things and, and do our reflections and everything. The gospel cannot be reduced for a breviary for the kneeling board. The gospel is an indispensable, I like this word, indispensable is script for legislation and administration, for service and obedience. Christ does not draw a line between church and workplace. The whole earth is simultaneously his prayer altar and his work arena. So whatever we are, we can use his teachings and his guidance to be behaving like that. So it's the prayer altar. And behaving by his teachings we can also work it towards other people implementing those values. Because when we, when we use those values on us, make no mistakes about it. We are impressing other people. Impressing, not in, because we are showing off to other people. We are impressing or printing on their souls the values that we are, uh, that we are living for. When we act as we say, that makes a tremendous, a huge impact on somebody else's life. So we don't have to be in the church to be studying and living those values. We can live, we can be everywhere and, let, and, and taking these values from the church to the world outside. Because are we going to be seeing in a, further, in a few slides as well, the world will change when we change. So if you're expecting that people go to the church to listen or to learn about those teachings, we can do the, other, the opposite. We can talk, take these teachings out of the church, out of the physical uh, institution, and take this everywhere that we are. Because if we are able to live it by those examples, we're going to be demonstrating exactly what Jesus was expecting from us. But this passage doesn't, doesn't uh, end over here. The whole earth is simultaneously his prayer altar and his work arena. By praising him in the churches, while we denying him in the streets, that's why we became a shipwreck a thousand times due to our own fault. We failed to follow him because we were praising him in the churches, but we are forgetting about him on the streets. However, any place it can be consecrated to the divine service. So as I said a little earlier, if you take these teachings out of uh, the church environment, out of this physical building, and we take this to the streets, we're going to first be living and practicing what he taught us. And second, we're going to be sharing with other people these same values all the time. Because what happens to most of us? We share those values only when we are when we together in the church, in the mosque, on the synagogue, on the spiritual center, or whatever we are getting together to praise the divinity. 
But if we take those teachings and we start to leave this everywhere, so that's then we're going to be new, making a huge impact. Then we're going to be taking Jesus' church out of this circumspect uh, 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 building and taking this to whoever it needs that from us. But when you're talking about places, now we're, we're talking about, wow, it can be a place here, a place there. What is the most important place of our lives? Where, where we can start this implementation? When we can start these exercises and bring those values uh, to our most important and sacred place? Well, I would say that no doubts, the most important place of our lives, it's our home. The home is uh, what we can solve. This, 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 the home is, is, uh, is the foundation of our lives. Home is the primary cell of society, the cornerstone of our values. Society will be changing from inside out. It's not from the outside to the inside. Society will be changing our homes. Our homes, our values will, will be impacting the outside. Just like I was mentioned about the church. Once we take those teachings and those values out of the building and we can expand it to the outside, then we're going to impact in some other people's lives as well. In order to change society, we must first change ourselves. And where this transformation starts, this transformation starts with us in our home. So, for example, on Spiritists, on, we as Spiritists, we teach in and we talk a lot about the gospel at home, which I'm going to be talking a little bit more further down. Uh, the gospel of home, it's uh, something that we do, that we pray because it's, it's in a way to connect it with God. That's in a way to connect it with ourselves, to bring those teachings and those good energies and vibes to inside our house and everything. But I would like to make a distinction over here, which I think that maybe later on, who knows, we can change the terms gospel at home to the term gospel of home. And, and what is the difference? It's a subtle difference over there. It's just a two words, just a pronoun. It's, it's a little bit more than that. When you're talking about gospel at home, at home gives the impression, gives the perception that it means a place where we do things. So we're going to do the gospel at home. We're going to do the gospel at the garden. We're going to do the gospel at the pool, at the park, at the church, everywhere. So the gospel at home means that's just a place where we do things. But when we're talking about gospel off home, when we talk about off home, it gives a perception, a meaning of belonging means a place where things belongs to. So when we do the gospel of home, it means that my home belongs, or the gospel belongs to my home. It's not just a place where I do it. What I mean with that? Again, usually we pick a day in the week, certain, certain days, some time to do the gospel at home. We read the passage, we do some reflections, we do a prayer, we get the water and we drink it and life goes on. Five minutes later, we are fighting because nobody cleaned up uh, the table or because there is some garbage to take out or because something is broken and we didn't fix it or because some other circumstances we are fighting with uh, each other inside of our own home. So we just use the space and the place to do something that we had the obligation to do it. When we do it with the intention that implemented the gospel uh, uh, on our house, on our homes, and make it belonging to that space, we're going to be reflecting on the studies that we just made, the prayers that we just practiced, and we're going to start to avoid the complications, fights, misunderstandings, misunderstoods, and these kind of things. We're going to try to make sure that the gospel really belongs to our home. That's a, it's a, it's, it's a kind of a, a new idea that uh, I think it's important for us. And not just having the 
obligation or doing the gospel at home because the guys in the center said that's a good thing and we should be doing this on a weekly basis because it's going to help us. No, there's a purpose for that. It's not just because the guys at the center said that it's good. There is a purpose. There's a reason. There is a, um, an outcome that we can take out of these studies to implement in our lives and make ourselves better each and every day, step by step, little by little. But each and every day, we're going to be doing better and being better and evolving. Make no mistakes about that. We are here in this life to live this incarnation better than when we came in. So far, can we truly say that we are better now than we were 20 years ago, 30 years ago? Are you evolving, really, in our values, behaviors, ideas, concepts, attitudes? If we compare ourselves what we were 20, 30 years ago, can we truly say that we evolve it? Well, if we do, good for you. If we don't, we still have an opportunity to get back in track. Because at the end of our lives, I, would, I was going to say at the end of the day. No, not the end of the day. At the end of our lives, we should be living this life much better than we, when we came in. That's our purpose over here. That's how we learn. That's, that's the main reason why we are here. Before moving forward, I would like to bring a concept also and an idea, which is on one of the basics of spiritism, which is called the universality of the, the teachings. Uh, when Kardec was um, grabbing all the information and getting everything that he needed to uh, publish the Spiritist book, one of uh, the um, one of the tools that he used was to spread out or send out his questions, the same questions, to different mediums in different places and different countries. So he would be sending questions um, to sometimes to Russia, to Finland, to England, even in, in France and some other places in France, in Italy and everything, and, and to starting to compare uh, the answers. So at that time, 1840s, 1850s, uh, there was no email, no Facebook, no Instagram, no CNN, nothing like that. So all the communications uh, were done through mail. So we had to write, you had to send a letter, uh, wait for the answer a couple of months uh, later, maybe three months later. And then we're gonna, and there was no way that a people could be connecting and uh, inter interchanged or interlinked as we are today, as so connected as we are. So whatever one was saying over there in England, it was kind of uh, harsh and difficult to that. I could be finding out through other people what is going to be saying in Finland, Russia, or even France, Italy, or something like that. So every all the answers that Kardec gathered, he was comparing for the same questions. If the answers were the same, the answers were coming from different sources, on different timing, from different places, from different mediums and spirits. But all the answers were matching. So that's what we call the universality of, this, of the teachings. The same information came from different sources and different ways on different times, but with the same meaning, with the same core message. That's one of the things that it's important to have in mind in order to understand the next concept that I'm going to be bringing up. The next concept, it says, what we were talking about over here, about the, uh, this idea of the gospel at home and gospel off home. Let's compare this guidance from spiritism with uh, some other religions as well. What other religions would say about this idea? Surprise. Um, our brothers from uh, the Church of Jesus is Christ of Latter-day Saints or the Mormons. The Mormons have a gathering, what they call family home evening. Family home evening, it's a time to strength family ties. We do this by learning the gospel together, by listening to each other's feelings, thoughts, and ideas, and by enjoying activities together. It is usually held on Monday evenings. Whoa. Whoa, 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 whoa. 
So you are saying that they have a day in the week, usually the same day at the same time, when they go to learn the gospel together, listening to each other's feelings, and by enjoying the activities together, that's pretty much like we just saw on Spiritism with the gospel at home, right? Okay, that might be a coincidence. Um, let me see something else. My, what say uh, our friends uh, from the, the Muslims? What the Muslims have to say about that? Well, on this website, which is the International Quran News Agency, we learned that one of the most important goals for any Muslim family is to build a deep connection with the Quran and one of the best ways to do it is to learn Quran together as a family. What? Whoa. Imagine having a family that sits together to understand the words of Allah. That connects thoughts, uh, that connects through the, the stories in the Quran. Or that speaks the language of the Quran to one another. All of these do not only increase your love for the deen, it also definitely brings you closer as a family. If you desire to carry your family along in your journey to understand the Quran, some tips below can help. And below are the guidances, which, guess what? Same time of the week, getting together, understanding and discussing this and together, sharing experiences and values and everything. I just didn't include this because it didn't fit on, on my screen. But that's exactly what it says about that. Okay, so we saw the Mormons, the Mormons. We saw the Muslims. So what about the Jewish? What the Jewish says about this? Well, on this uh, synagogue specifically, uh, parents and children, both boys and girls, as well as grandparents and grandchildren, gather in the synagogues to study Torah as a family unit. Um, they host a weekly Saturday night uh, Torah learning program for the entire family. The program is called something that I cannot pronounce, I'm sorry, which is a phrase that borrowed from the Shema, which means that you should throughoutly teach your three children the words of Torah. Holy moly. And what is this if not the universally of these, the teachings apply it for this concept? So, as, as after we see all of this, uh, bringing the Jesus Church, the Divinity Church, the teachings of God to the outer world, it's almost like a divine guidance for all people, for all religions, for all humankind, in order to spread and most importantly, to live by these divine principles. Because when we compare all the religions, it doesn't matter what's the origin of that, 90% of all teachings, it's the same. We differ in the form and the way that we interpret this and that. But at 90% of all teachings, it's absolutely the same. Problem is that we focus, as we as humankind, we focus on the 10% that we differ from each other. And from there, we make all of our differences. We make all of our fights and, and everything else. But uh, we have clearly here a divine commandment to follow, to take those teachings out of the churches and take it to the streets and live by them on a daily basis. So that's what the church of Jesus means. That's what Jesus' church means. Take those teachings out of the buildings, bring it to our lives, and spread out through attitudes, through behavior, through new values, through new things that we are teaching and sharing with each other. That's the idea. That's the concept. But in order to implement that, how do we do our gospel of home? How do we can, uh, uh, how can we, can we bring this to our lives? To study the gospel in the light of the Spiritist doctrine, uh, which makes it is possible to understand and in spirit and truth, 
thus allowing us to guide our lives according to the master's orientation. So why we should be doing the gospel of home, to study the gospel in the light of the spiritist and doctrine. And why is that important? Because we are better? No, <laughs> far away from that. Because when you take most of the Jesus teachings, if you bring those teachings just for one life, for one existence, for one incarnation, most of them doesn't make too much sense. Um, forgive your neighbor or be kind to other people, be indulgent. Why I should be doing that? This guy just took advantage out of me. If I would be living just one life, uh, what is the justice on that? Why I should be doing this? What is in there for me if I'm not going to be uh, seeing the outcome of the purpose of this? Yeah, if you just see one life, it's kind of uh, weird and strange to be thinking like that. But when you think about the spiritist doctrine, the immortality of the soul, the reincarnation, the multiple uh, worlds that we can inhabit in the future or what we had been from the past and everything else, when we bring those spiritist doctrines, the concepts, and we plug in into Jesus' teachings, it makes a lot of sense. It makes a lot of sense to understand that justice is divine. It's not up to us to pursue justice. It's up to God to make things happen in order that people get a, hold accountable for their own mistakes and their own wrongdoings. That is not up to, do, to us to do that. It's not up to us to pursue revenge. It's not up to us not to forget or forgive someone. It's up to us to live as by Jesus' teachings because now it makes sense because our uh, his kingdom is not from this world. So when we pick this, pick this phrase, my kingdom is not from this world, what does he mean? Uh, how come it's not from this world? It's from what world? The spiritual world, the um, enlightened world, from the divine world. What world is my kingdom? But when we bring the spiritist doctrine concepts into that, it makes it a lot easier to understand. And once we understand something, we follow and we implement and we accept it a lot easier. Now it makes sense. Why should I be behaving like that? Why I should be benevolent? Why I should be indulgent? Why I should be practicing charity with all my strength and everything that I do? Because now I understand that we are here in an evolvement process, that everyone is imperfect, that we all make mistakes, not intentionally. That's because we just don't know better. That we're going to have chances in the futures to get along with our own people. That people have prejudices on us in the past. They will pay us back in some way. And the same way that with the people that we hurt for some reason, certain point of our lives, we're going to get also the opportunity to pay them back and make amendments. So now it makes a lot of sense when we bring those spiritist doctrine concepts into Jesus' teachings. Why we should be doing that as well? To make the gospel better understood, felt, and exemplified at home and in all places. And also to expand the literal and the spiritual knowledge of the gospel in order to offer even more confidence to other creatures. To offer, uh, to expand our spiritual knowledge and offer it with more confidence to other creatures. But uh, how do we offer the gospel? It's not with the words, as we can already notice. It's with the behavior and attitudes. Preach the gospel all the times. Use words if necessary. So how do we preach the gospel if we're not using words? By my behavior, by my attitudes. That screams out louder than any word, any speech that we can give, any talk that we can be given, any guidance or counsel that we should be giving to someone else. Our behavior, our attitudes, that speaks much, much louder. So preach the gospel at all times and use the words when necessary. 
This phrase, it's attributed to Francis of Assisi, but uh, there is no confirmation that it was from him. But I'll take that, what I get from Wikipedia. It's from Francis of Assisi. Uh, but also Christ had already said that he, he, that he who does not live in his teachings is like the foolish man who builds his house on the sand. There is no base. There is no sustention. Again, society will change from inside out. In order to change the society, we must first change ourselves. And ta-da! How do we change ourselves? So everything that I just said so far, it comes out to this slide. How to implement the gospel of home in our lives and our ambience and transform into implement like that. It's so easy. It's easy, easy, easy. It's just living like Jesus. It's just a matter of the fact that we just have to live like Jesus. No, it's not complicated. You guys should be saying, no, this guy is crazy. How am I going to be living like Jesus? When we talk about humbleness, tolerance, benevolence, forgiveness, these are the main behaviors and aspects of Jesus' behavior and life. Uh, in everything, on a net daily basis, most of the time, he was doing exactly that. If you take pride and selfishness out of this equation, how hard is to be humble? How hard is to be tolerant? Benevolent. How hard is to forgive if you take our pride out of that? The problem of living like Jesus is not that's because it's difficult. That's because we make it difficult because we added to that equation pride and selfishness. Take this out. All of this behavior, it becomes a lot easier, much, much easier to be following. So it's up to us to implement, work our, our, our uh, bias regarding uh, selfishness and pride and starting to being humble, tolerant, benevolent, and forgiving people all the time. If we forgive about now, I'm not going to be going to his house or his place or I'm not going to be talking to this person because in 1857, that person told me something or said me something that I didn't like. Really? We're going to be holding the grudge for 100 years, 200 years, and you're not going to get together anymore? Make no mistake it's about that. Get along with your enemy while you are walk, walking the pathway with him. Because now, if not, the judge, judge will deliver you to God, and the punishment or the harshment could be much worse. But our pride doesn't allow us to forgive and just forget about what we heard or what we were told or that people said or, or had done against us. But I take those two issues out of our lives, pride and selfishness, everything becomes much, much easier. Um, Jesus' church can be implemented in practices everywhere. But it starts at home because that's the place that we can practice. That's the place where we were required the most to forget about our pride, our selfishness, and then we can be humble, tolerant, benevolent, and forgiveness. That's the place where we're going to be able to practice in order to take the gospel and take it Jesus' church wherever we go all the time. So at the end of the day, at the end of our lives, we can leave this incarnation much better than we came. There is a lot of examples about Jesus' um, humbleness, uh, tolerance, uh, benevolence, and everything. When was Jesus humble, for example? First, when he accepted the mission from God to, came, to come down to earth. Let's say the guy who got from God the matter, the, the raw material to build our planet and spent 4 billion years molding this mass in order to get what we are today, this guy was asked by God to come down to earth and leave his example so he can live a life in teaching for us. And he accepted the mission. 
God was uh, Jesus was also humble when he kneeled down on his knees to wash your disciples' feet during the um, the Last Supper. That uh, task was reserved for the slaves. When you had someone visiting your home, you had the slaves washing your guests' feet in order to show up that to that guest that he was welcome at your place. So the slaves would do that. Jesus worked and served as a slave. Jesus was forgiven is when he forgiven it, uh, when he said all the time, go and make no mistakes. On the cross, for example, for the soldiers, Father, forgive themselves. They don't know what they are doing. He was uh, benevolent and he was uh, with, uh, for example, with uh, Maria and Magdala. He wasn't paying attention on her wrongdoings. He was just paying attention on her protection and what he could be doing. When he was tolerant, when he was helping Peter, even knowing that Peter was going to deny him three times in the same night. So if you take the gospel, there are several examples and behaviors and attitudes of Christ that will represent exactly those values. It's up to us to take the pride and the selfishness out of this equation and make our lives in an order that we can live by those examples and live by those teachings. In order to do that, we ask for Christ's blessing and support so we can embrace those teachings and values implement in our lives so at the end of our incarnation, we can be living this earth much better than we came. Thank you so very much for your attention on this bright uh, Sunday morning. Very sunny, very beautiful weather outside. I uh, thank you so very much for giving me your time to share this uh, study. And I hope to see you guys sometime soon in the future. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ali. That was really, really cool. You brought some information that all of a sudden I caught myself like this. Like, oh, this is really cool. <laughs> didn't know that oh very nice um i'm sure i'm not the only one who who enjoyed this presentation and we're very glad because it stays uh on our youtube channel and on our facebook as well so that you who won thank you gratitude for sharing with us um so you can share with other people and so that they can understand a little bit about jesus's church that was a really cool really cool topic um ale may i ask you to do our final prayer as well Yes, of course. Thank you so much for the privilege. Uh, dear God, our Heavenly Father, thank you so very much for another day in our lives. Thank you for the opportunity and for the teachings that we just received. May your light be shine upon us, brightening our minds so we can take those teachings and keep them saved in our brains and our minds. May your light be uh, warming our hearts so we can live by these teachings and implement these in our lives and be sharing them with other people that are in much more need than we are. Give us the strength that we need to fight against our own imperfections. So we can be tomorrow much better persons than we were yesterday. And we can be at the end of our life much better than when we came in. May your light also be with uh, all of the workers, your workers. doesn't matter the religions or the, the, the professions that they have. May your light be with all of them, guiding, supporting, and strengthening their wheels so they can be fulfilling the roles that you've trusted on their hands. May also your light be shine up on the minds and the hearts of all our brothers and sisters which are in need out there, the ones which are struggling with uh, their health, physical health, spiritual health, mental health. May they may then be uh, embraced and supported and protected by your light and your um, and your uh, blessings so they can feel your presence at their side all the time. And on us, dear God, just to say thank you. Thank you once again for this wonderful life that you provide us. Thank you. So be it. That's it. Be it. Thank you. Thank you, Ale. Thank you guys for joining us this morning. Thank you for being with us. Once again, the uh, Spirit Center that Ale 
is running with his, his wife and other friends is plenitude uh spirit is society of orlando plenitude ss as in double s as in org is their website uh, so make sure that you visit and they're also on facebook in case you want to look for them and follow them as well on this note have a great sunday everyone take care